Hello again. Last Wednesday, we started talking about the church, and we talked about how the church is Christ's. In other words, the church belongs to Jesus, and the church is made up of those who are called out, the called out ones, the ecclesia. In other words, it's made up of those of us who are called out of the world by the gospel to go back into the world with the gospel because the church is the hope of the world. Meaning that every Christian becomes the hands and Jesus, the hands and feet of Jesus. We are the body of Christ. And today, we're going to go ahead and continue looking at the church and talk about how the church is the flock, how the church is the bride, how the church is the family of Christ. So, we said that the church is Christ's flock. Just what does that mean? Well, you know, when we talk about a flock, it doesn't always have to do with animals. In general, a flock is a group or a band of people, and we see the Apostle Paul using this metaphor for the church in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 when he cautions the elders at the church at Ephesus telling them to keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. Now I want to take just a moment and focus on the last part of that verse. There we're told that God's flock, that is his church, Christians, was bought with his own blood. Think about that. The church is so valuable to God. The church here in Orangevale or, or wherever Christians gather in his name is priceless to God. After all, he purchased the church with his own blood. Okay, well, back to the part of us being a flock. Now, when I think of a flock, I tend to think of sheep, you know, and that's, that's really the idea behind the illustration that Paul uses here. And even Jesus uses that same illustration elsewhere. Jesus teaches us that he is the good shepherd, and he is, in fact, the good shepherd. And elders within the church are supposed to shepherd the flock. In other words, they're supposed to spiritually lead the people and spiritually protect the people. And just how are they supposed to do that? Well, just like the Lord would, obviously, right? The words from the 23rd Psalm always come to mind when I think about shepherds. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that's how a shepherd is supposed to shepherd, right? And so if those who are shepherding those in the church were like that, things would be really good. Again, the church is Christ's flock. The church is also the bride of Christ. Over in John chapter three, when John the Baptist is talking about Jesus, he's asked about Jesus and the things going on with his disciples. He said this in John chapter 3 in verses 27 through 30. He said, A man can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, and again, this is John the Baptist talking about himself, I am not the Christ, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, John writes, says, sorry, and is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. In other words, John the Baptist is saying, now that Jesus is here, the bridegroom, he, John, must become less 
and Jesus, the bridegroom, must become greater. Okay, so again, clearly the bridegroom is Christ. But then that begs the question, right? Who is the bride? Well, it's you and me. It's Christians. It's his church. Over in Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul shares a powerful illustration about the church being the bride of Christ, starting in verse 25, where he encourages husbands to love your wives. I'm sorry, husbands to love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or by any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are all members of his body. Again, the church is shown here to be clearly the bride of Christ. Now, think with me just for a minute. Do you know any loving bridegroom who doesn't love his bride? Do you, do you know any loving bridegroom who would tolerate insults, attacks, and criticisms of his bride? I should sure not, hope not. I mean, he loves his bride, and he would do anything. In the case of Jesus, he died for his bride. Now let me ask you, shouldn't we have the same love for the church as Jesus does? The church is the bride of Christ. The church is also the family of God. And we know that because whenever someone becomes a Christian, they become a child of God. Galatians chapter 3 and verses 26 through 28 says it this way, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And as a son, or daughter as it may be, of God, we together make up God's family, like Ephesians 2.19 says. Now, think about all that for a second. You and me, those of us who are Christians, are a son or a daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are family. And families, well, we, we care for each other, right? We, we love each other. They, we help each other. We build one another up. And, you know, and we can see that happening very early on in the family of God in Acts chapter 2 and verses 44 through 47. Let me share that passage with you, and that will be the last passage we'll mention this morning. Well, it's this afternoon. Used to preaching in the morning, you know. All right, picking up in verse 44, this is Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 44. It says, All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The church is the family of God. Aren't you glad that you're a part of God's family? Isn't it, isn't it comforting to know that you're a part of God's flock? Aren't you rejoicing in the truth that you're the bride of Christ and, and, and have an incredible loving groom? I hope so, because that's what God wants for you and me. And if you're not a part of this church, I'd like to encourage you to message me and we could talk about that and make it right. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your church and for allowing us to be a part of your loving family. Thank you, Father, for the comfort we have in knowing that we are part of your flock. And thank you, Father, for the honor of being your bride, of being someone that you love so much that you would die for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, I want to thank you for spending some time with me this afternoon. 
God bless.